Welcome to the Chapter 1 lecture for Management 3120, Operations Management. I am Dr. Bill Perkins, and I am going to provide you with a video lecture based on the material found in the textbook, Practical Operations Management, 2nd Edition, from Natalie Simpson and Philip Hancock. We're going to cover Chapter 1. In this chapter, we will define operations management, we will classify operations, and we will discuss roles of operations managers in regard to decision making and operations within an organization. So in this chapter, look for operations management as the creation of value, making it the heart of any organization, the balance of productivity, sustainability, and responsibility in successful operations, and types of decision making. Uh, and product and degree of uncertainty and control and the operations within an organization as well as supporting professional and academic societies. One of the most enduring descriptions of operations is transformation. Any undertaking transforming some set of resources into some result can be thought of as an operation. Therefore, operations is defined as a set of activities dedicated to the transformation of inputs into outputs of greater value. This figure, taken from page two of the textbook, illustrates operations as a classic input slash output model of operations management. This model helps clarify what operations such as manufacturing, healthcare, agriculture, and education have in common. As this slide depicts, many of these types of operations encompass similar categories of resources. So they all require resources such as people, materials, equipment, knowledge, and infrastructure. Organizations that engage in manufacturing operations require the materials to develop the products. Healthcare centers require people to provide services. Uh, agriculture operations require equipment and education requires knowledge as educators engage in cultivating learners gaining more knowledge. So these are just some examples. However, all these examples require all the mentioned inputs, people, material, equipment, knowledge, and infrastructure. So moving on from the inputs to the actual transformation. Uh, the aforementioned areas of operations, being manufacturing, healthcare, agriculture, and education, will experience transformation in areas such as assembly, uh, transportation, extraction, um, cultivation, and fabrication. Um, this transformation sector clearly represents the operation itself. Um, Whereas the inputs and outputs of any given operation are identifiable entities, such as people, knowledge, and goods, the associated operation consists of processes or actions taken to create the outputs. Thus, uh, operations management is the planning and facilitating of those actions. And after the transformation comes the development of outputs. And here are three common examples of outputs being goods and services, employment, and pollution. Remember, the fundamental purpose of any operation is to produce outputs more valuable than inputs consume. Thus, the purpose of operations man management is to create value. Say that again, the purpose of operations management is to create value. So as we just stated, the purpose of operations management is to create value and the literal difference um, in value, uh, you know, value between outputs and inputs is performance measure known as value added or value creation. So value added is the difference between the total value of outputs and the total value of inputs associated with an operation. So value creation is essentially achieving positive value added. 
Successful value creation ultimately depends on a balance of related achievements, some of which are easy to evaluate and others less so. So figure 1.2 illustrated here and taken from page 3 of the textbook introduces these three interdependent elements being productivity, sustainability, and responsibility. So we're going to cover these three elements uh, further in the next slides. So productivity measures the success of the operation by comparing its inputs to its outputs, and it's generally the most visible and measurable of the three elements connected to figure 1.2. Whereas value added uh, refers to the difference between the value of inputs and outputs, productivity compares the same values as a ratio, such as cars per shift for manufacturing or miles per gallon. Um, historically, technological innovation increases the productivity of most, although not all, transformation processes. So inappropriately, low productivity indicates lost opportunity to create additional value from the same sets of inputs, which would be kind of innovation. Um, a wastefulness that highlights the fused area between productivity, sustainability, and responsibility. So low productivity indicates lost opportunity to create additional value from the same set of inputs, a wastefulness that highlights the fused area between productivity, sustainability, and responsibility. And again, productivity is defined as a measurement of value creation calculated as a ratio of the values of in output to input. Whereas productivity is a familiar measure of performance, high productivity does not necessarily indicate a well-managed operation. As figure 1.2 suggests, successful value creation also depends on the sustainability of that operation, the extent to which operating at a particular time does not cre uh, create greater costs to be um, paid in the future. So again, um, successful value creation also depends on the sustainability of that operation, the extent being the extent to which operating at a particular time does not create greater costs to be paid in the future. So we could define sustainability as the degree to which activity with immediate benefit does not incur greater costs in long term. Again, so we could define sustainability as the degree to which activity with immediate benefit does not incur greater costs in the long term. Now, lack of attention to sustainability can occur at any of the three stages, being input, transformation, and output. Uh, energy, landfills, pollution, and waste disposal have presented significant issues in all three phases, adversely affecting sustainability. Now, sometimes fixing unsustainable uh, practices in disposal can simultaneously solve problems with input availability. Now, this type of problem solving is inspired by biomimic uh, biomimicry and the or the imitation of natural systems. So uh, natural systems form uh, continuous cycles of consumption, uh, production, uh, reclamation, and uh, regeneration, whereas the traditional view of an operation is linear, much like what we saw earlier in figure 1.1. It was highly linear with step one, step two, step three, or phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, it wasn't so much of a cycle or an iterative uh, process as the way it was depicted. Uh, according to the figure, uh, there is a starting and stopping point. Uh, more contemporary approaches are said to be green if they are sustainable, and these approaches are also better described as cycles that loop the straight line system as in figure 1.1 back upon itself. So the internationally recognized symbol for recycling consists of three black arrows 
folded into a uh, into a loop uh, as shown on this uh, collection bin. So created by a college student in the early 1970s, this symbol suggests an unending use of outputs as inputs, which in a circular reformatting of the traditional models of operations in figure 1.1. Now this is also a good example um, of uh, biomimicry uh, because uh, recycling is an effort to mirror nature's theme of repeating uh, recycles or cycles of transformation. So again, this is a good example, um, you know, because recycling is an effort to mirror nature's theme of repeating cycles of transformation. So even if an operation carefully uses inputs to create outputs without waste or pollution, that operation will not be sustainable if it cannot cope with the changes in the environment. So sustainability also relies on robustness or an ability to operate despite uh, changing conditions. So our world has grown in increasingly complex over the last few decades and the average life of U.S. companies has been decreasing throughout time. Uh, this indicates a lack of robustness as companies fail to cope with uh, changes driven by globalization, uh, climate change, and advancing technology. Now we're going to talk about the third interdependent element responsibility. Responsibility has multiple dimensions. Corporate social responsibility concerns the quality of interaction between business and surrounding society, whereas employees of a corporation also have direct responsibilities to perform for their employer. So you have a social responsibility and then you have more of a direct responsibility. Uh, corporate social responsibility is at its most visible when a business publicly assumes responsibility for damage inflicted by its operations, uh, such as uh, accident response and voluntary recalls, when a company recalls its product on its own. Um, however, corporate social responsibility is uh, defined largely by an obligation to pursue sustainability. Now, some corporations such as Campbell Soup and Dow Chemical have vice presidents of social responsibility and sustainability. So there's essentially a personnel who are staffing these positions with a sole focus on social responsibility. Now, but these issues are not limited to job titles for particular managers. Okay, some argue that decision making in any organization is driven by the incentives offered to the decision makers and little progress toward long-term sustainability will be made if performance measurements and rewards emphasize short-term results. Uh, not surprisingly, many uh, companies recognized for corporate social responsibility have invested considerable effort in developing green scorecards and other new managerial tools to motivate, uh, to naturally motivate responsible decision making, uh, seeking the highest level of achievement in sustainability. Now, responsible decision-making guides ethical behavior. Ethics are simply rules that identify good versus bad behavior, and these rules uh, vary between uh, cultures and even uh, between large organizations. Um, ethics are not tangible and specific like legal code. They are principles governing conduct, delineating good from bad. And remember, uh, when it comes down to responsibility, it is an obligation to perform. Now, because operations management is embedded in all organized activity, we categorize different operations according to common traits to clarify similarities among organizations. Here in Figure 1.4, taken from page 10 of the textbook, illustrates four common frameworks for organizing various operations into useful groupings, each one providing insight into some aspect of successful management within the groups. 
operations management is often internally organized into uh, good versus, uh, goods versus services. Uh, classifying each operation according to the tangibility of a product. So declaring something tangible generally indicated that it is, it is solid and it can be perceived uh, by sense of touch. However, whether a product is perceivable by touch does not completely explain its tangibility. Most products are a mix of tangible and intangible elements. So tangibility refers to the degree of perceivable uh, physical essence of a product. And products recognized by the consumer as physical objects, including grocery items, uh, personal electronics, and clothing are referred to as goods. In contrast, services provide valuable actions, but little or no tangible uh, content. Describing uh, products from internet access to education to medical care. Now some healthcare services are valuable products that include little or no tangible content. In this picture value is created through the interaction of the physical therapist on the right and her client on the left. Uh, one distraction in this uh, pure service example is the presence of specialized tangibles such as parallel bars uh, the client is using for support. But these are inputs to the physical therapy process, not outputs. Now for the company ma uh, that manufactures the parallel bars, it would be an output. But please don't uh, you know, get confused here. The physical therapy is a pure service. And the parallel bars for physical therapy or a service like this uh, would only be an input, not an output. Now, figure 1.5 here, illustrated on this slide and taken from page 10 of the textbook, shows a few distinctions between goods and services and operations. Although this category, categorization uh, most accurately represents two extreme ends of the continuum, uh, whereas the tangibility of a product is not generally as simple as a yes or no answer to a question about touch, it is helpful to look at the two extremes first to uh, better understand the blending of goods and services. So we're going to look at them now. So at the top you have your tangible products uh, and intangible products. Um, tangible products uh, for the goods. Um, intangible more for the services, service operations. With the uh, goods comes less customer contact. Um, for services, more customer contact. Uh, even at the output, you'll see uh, more customer uh, contact. Um, for goods, you have more reliance on specialized equipment, uh, service operations, more about the individual who's delivering the service and less reliance on specialized equipment. And for goods operations, uh, you have less reliance on skilled labor. And uh, whereas the uh, service operations, you have more reliance on skilled labor. So I just used a uh, physical therapist as a, an example in the past couple slides. Um, so you look at the fact that it's service, um, it's a service operation. So although there's parallel bars, um, you know, healing somebody who's going through physical therapy, there could be alternate means. You know, they can use something else. Uh, they're going to be a little less reliant. The parallel bars aren't the uh, end all, you know, for healing the individual who is uh, requiring the service. And uh, the physical therapist is a skilled labor. Okay, so it's uh, not something that's going to be done through a uh, a uh, performance objective or a uh, task order that would be written with some instructions. Um, on a manufacturing line. So it is skilled labor. So when it comes to good oper goods operations, uh, manufacturing of, is the production of goods, although not all goods are manufactured. The term manufacturing implies mass production, whereas goods might 
be custom made or grown or extracted from the ground. Uh, you'll see in the later chapters there are actually organizations out there that have to do an analysis whether they should make a product or buy a product. Uh, which one's going to be more uh, cost benefit. Um, now uh, one positive result of producing something physical such as a automobile is that this output is likewise storable as inventory at least for some short period of time. So this single condition of uh, storage uh, capability provides multiple benefits and they are well first the operation can be located where it is most beneficial for production and the product shipped elsewhere. Uh, less customer contact is required of the operation because goods need not be produced where they are consumed and uh, the operation can respond to surges in demand by stockpiling goods early instead of increasing production capacity. Now the, the uh, two takeaways here are that inventory refers to tangible items awaiting sale or use and stockpiling refers to producing or securing goods in advance of demand. Now when it comes to service operations manufacturing uh, presents some challenges but the provision of services may be more challenging. Now because services are intangible they cannot be stored for future use. So in general service operations suffer the following restrictions. Um, most services must locate where the customer has access to the operation not where the operation can function best. Uh, many services require the uh, customer as an input to the process um, so customer contact is higher overall. Um, services cannot be stockpiled for future use so service operations has fewer operations to handle fluctuating demand and services usually copy um, with higher variability of inputs uh, and outputs making prediction um, and planning more difficult. So when looking at both goods and services in reality most products result from a blend of tangible and intangible uh, elements. For this reason it is, it is difficult. It is very difficult to identify an example of a pure good or a pure service. Even something as tangible as a car or clothing usually requires shipping to a convenient retail location. And this, uh, this tan intangible but valuable element of the product is bundled into the purchase uh, price. So if you go look at the sticker of a car, there's always some kind of a delivery fee and other uh, service fees that are associated in getting that car uh, for sale on the lot. Now any operation is a system, a web of related uh, parts cooperating towards some common purpose. Now sometimes this system is a set of parts within a single organization while other operations involve the interactions of multiple organizations as a, a single system. So when a uh, when scope of a system is wide enough to include every organization participating in the ultimate delivery of a particular product to an end customer, a complete supply chain for that product must be coordinated. So what is a supply chain? A supply chain is defined as a system consisting of all organizations that play some role in supplying a particular product to a customer. As depicted here in figure 1.7 taken from page 14 of the textbook, almost all consumer products are provided through supply chain networks. Uh, each organization within this network might only communicate with one other organization although the customer's experience with the product is ultimately dependent on all. Uh, also modern supply chains often link up organizations and customers throughout the world and include additional organizations working in the linkages between those businesses appearing on this slide. 
uh, devoted to the transportation of goods along the uh, along the arrows. So a value chain is a system uh, consisting of all functions within an organization that play some role in adding value to the organization's product. And this illustration includes all the complexity of internal value chains while also requiring that these conditions be satisfied through the supply chain. Now operations can differ from their, um, their form of governance or ownership of the operations. So grouping by governance often brings together operations with common perspectives in decision, in decision making. And operations management has historically focused on control. Uh, good control of an operation includes efficient implementation of decisions, accurate prediction of outcomes, and prevention of external influence. These are all reasonable assumptions in some industrial settings, but many modern operations do not enjoy high levels of control due to the nature of their business. So when control shifts away from the decision maker, uncertainty takes its place, although this person or group must still decide how best to proceed. Now operations that are literally exposed to the environment, such as building construction and outdoor events, um, naturally suffer higher degrees of uncertainty and lower degrees of control. And uncertainty decreases with practice. So managing a unique event presents more uncertainties than the daily management of a long running operation. So when operations management is considered under all possible conditions, it is often loosely subdivided along this range of uncertainty uh, versus control as illustrated here in figure, fig, figure 1.8 on this slide, which was taken from page 17 of the textbook. So production implies deliberate creation of value over time, such as in the manufacturing of a good or uh, provision of, uh, let's say, provision of electricity. Uh, whereas operation ma management can be argued to be as old as um, organized human activity. Uh, production management was the first form of operations management to be recognized as a teachable business discipline. Now mass production uh, minimized uncertainty uh, because it transforms a narrow range of carefully selected inputs when in within a facility designed for, uh, to reliably create only certain outcomes. Now, ongoing operation of this permanent facility allows for the accumulation of data and experience to use in further improving the efficiency of the system, a methodology known as scientific management. As it says here, scientific management is a methodology stressing the use of data collection and analysis to redesign processes and improve efficiency. A project differs from the traditional understanding of production in that a project is completed once, uh, resulting in some unique form of value creation and projects may create something tangible such as the construction of a building or the painting of a portrait or something intangible such as providing legal service to a particular client uh, concerning a particular case. So for the purposes of this chapter a project is a unique collection of activities creating a particular outcome. Uh, Operations managers deal with events and incidents. The term event has several meanings, uh, but the type of operation best known as an event is in fact a particular type of project. Now the activities associated with the completion of a successful event are undertaken with a known 
and plan time interval, and thus event planning and management are examples of project management. Uh, a, an incident presents a manager with the maximum challenge of uncertainty as is, incidents are essentially unscheduled events uh, that abruptly require completion. Thus, incidents are usually unexpected uh, exceptions or disruptions to other types of planning, creating a need for a specialized form of project planning. Now remember, an unscheduled event requiring immediate resolution is an incident. Now, in the managerial hierarchy of decision making, strategy is depicted at the topmost level because it occurs first. A strategy is a methodology and resulting plan that identifies the long term goals of an organization. Now, as I just stated, in the managerial hierarchy of decision making, strategy is depicted at the topmost level because it occurs first. Strategic decision making focuses on selecting the goals and overall direction of an organization and can also be described as uh, broad scale, long term planning. Now, if the consequences of a decision, good or bad, will be felt for more than one year, it is usually fair to declare it strategic in nature. Now, much of the management and operations management is devoted to tactics, that is the uh, ongoing processes of determining how to pursue goals. Now, in other words, tactics mean uh, to pursue strategic goals with available resources. Uh, tactical decision making uh, combines the goal-related input from the strategic level with the reality of resources available, identifying solutions ready for implementation. Now, tactical decisions also differ from strategic de uh, decisions in that tactics rarely address planning horizons longer than a single year and may propose solutions only a few weeks in length. Um, often, the focus at the tactical level is optimization or the development of the best possible solution given the uh, combination of strategic objectives uh, and resource availability. Now, as examples, uh, developing inventory control policies or analyzing waiting lines in a service system often focuses on identifying at least costly, the least costly alternative. However, the greater the complexity or uncertainty in the planning environment, the more likely tactical decision makers will focus, uh, will shift focus to find good feasible solutions to support strategic goals, as a pursuit of one absolute best answer is not always practical. Now, implementation is the bottom level of the hierarchy of decision making, but no less important. Um, implementation accepts the uh, solutions identified at the tactical level and puts them into action uh, because implementation is a guiding action and also some, is sometimes referred to as the operational level of the hierarchy. Um, an example would entail an operation of an assembly line at this level consists of assuring that the uh, appropriate personnel and materials required by the tactical design of the assembly uh, line are actually in place for its uh, daily operations. Now, operations management is a distinct discipline with a membership of people who spend the majority of their time directly involved with operational issues. Now, locating operations management in an organization begins with considering how it relates to other business disciplines within that organization. So, operations is considered one of the three central functions of any business organization, sharing this distinction with the disciplines of marketing and finance, while other disciplines such as information technology and human resources support this combined endeavor. Now, although active in any organization, 
uh, operations that's not necessarily of equal significance relative to the uh, other business functions. You know, given the nature of the organization, what kind of organization is it? What's its goals? What's its uh, strategic goals? What's its purpose? Um, you know, what what is it set out to do? Why does the organization exist? So figure 1.10 taken from page 25 of the textbook provides illustrations of the relative mix of these three functions in a regional hospital and also a jewelry store and we're going to look at a resort hotel. So here we have the regional hospital. You know, think about everything that goes on in the hospital. Of course, the operations, um, you know, section or uh, operations component is going to be much larger than the finance and the marketing. Now, uh, hospital marketing, you'll see it a little bit. Hospitals, for the most part, are, uh, you know, in, in cases, uh, not for profit. Uh, so, you know, and, and let's face it, if uh, you have the need for medical care, that's what's going to drive you going to the hospital. It's not going to be a television commercial or something enticing you. Um, so marketing, of course, is going to be the smaller part of the three, uh, with finance being two, because somebody has to pay for the medical treatments. And then you have uh, look at the operations. You have so much going on in the hospital. You have the uh, administrative operations. You have medical treatment. You have uh, you know uh, you know training. You have education. You have uh, there there's an array of operations going on in the hospital. You have different functions. Uh, it's highly cross-functional. You have a cardiac center, and then you have an uh, orthopedic section. You know. There's, you notice each floor has its own specific, uh, you know, functions to it. So, of course, operations is going to be huge in a hospital. Um, now, jewelry store, think about it. Finance and marketing, you know. Operations, you're, you're manning a counter, you're staffing a counter. Um, kind of taking probably a just-in-time approach, uh, uh, you know, order... Uh, Order the uh, pricey jewelry as it's being sold. You don't want a huge surplus plus, or uh, you don't want a stockpile. Um, have things laying around. Um, so the operations are going to be significantly less with a jewelry store, uh, with finance being uh, large and marketing being large. And the resort hotel, same thing. Operations, you got the hospitality management operations going on. Marketing's huge. You want to draw people there. Uh, a lot of marketing endeavors and finance, you know, it's essentially uh, the money that's being made on the resort at the time people stay and also with uh, people booking their stays. So finance is in fact going to be smaller, much more uh, stringently focused uh, than the operations and the marketing. So while the words of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation do go hand in hand, most entrepreneurs are not involved in inventing new products. So once defining a characteristic of an, on, of an entrepreneur is the willingness to bear the risk of business, as in the case of this owner of a service garage for heavy equipment. Entrepreneurs, such as this one, identify a need for the existing product and move the resources into place to meet that need, which is why they are also called uh, replicative uh, entrepreneurs. Now, here is the secret to success uh, to do something that is not new, but do it better, which makes operations management even more critical. It's all about doing more with less. Now, to summarize what we just talked about in the chapter and go through uh, the learning objectives, now, operations management is a paradox. You know, you have two um, opposing forces here, each equally right or important to address. Uh, it is the uh, both the oldest and one of the... Uh, youngest business disciplines, uh, which is evident when a single entrepreneur opens a small business or a nonprofit organization, musters volunteers to fill sandbags for flooding conditions, 
and a large corporation uh, carefully coordinate shipment across a global supply chain. Now, each of these uh, settings contains the creation of value, uh, the singular mission. Now, creation of value is the singular mission of, a, of successful operations. And operations management bundles together all actions required to create value. Now, these actions transform inputs into more valuable set of outputs, including, but not limited to, finished products for the customer. And the relative success of this process is expressed by its productivity, although long-term success of the operations should hinge upon sustainable and responsible management practices as well. Now, virtually any organized undertaking can be thought of as an operation, and thus it is useful to categorize similar operations according to important shared features such as tangibility of the product or a level of uncertainty in the operating environment. And within larger organizations, people who specialize in operations may be called operations managers, but also can be found working under specific job titles. And anyone called a manager or a planner in combination with another term is usually dedicated to that aspect of operations management. Now, an example of that would include production planner, supply chain managers, project managers, and event planners. And any job title that indicates responsibility for a mission-critical asset usually focuses on the operation of that asset and examples would include a store manager, branch manager, plant manager, a fleet manager, and location manager. And other operations uh, intensive job titles indicate a particular subject area within the discipline of operations that the holder of the title specializes in and that would be like a scheduler or an inventory planner or quality coordinator. Uh, I know a lot of these terms are very familiar to you, but there's a deliberate uh, reason for those terms. And finally, um, many consultants work intensively in operations management, uh, particularly when providing assistance with information systems development, uh, business process mapping, and quality movements seems to be a high demand for consultants in those areas. Now this concludes our chapter one lecture and please log onto the blackboard for all expectations and deliverables associated with this week in this chapter and I thank you for your participation in this uh, course in this lecture.